Sweden's Minister for Energy, Business and Industry, Ebba Bush. Uh, welcome to the stage to share your reflections on what we have heard and the green transition taking place. So welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you once again to Jan Moström. And uh, welcome to Sweden. I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to welcome you here to this mine. And um, my name, as you heard, is Ebba Busch. I'm uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of Sweden with special responsibility for energy, business and industry and uh, head of the Climate and Energy Department. Um, I've also had the great privilege uh, of being the party leader for the Christian Democrats here in Sweden, part of the EPP group within the European Parliament, sister party of the CDU in Germany, uh, for almost eight years now. And uh, as Minister for both Energy and Industry, I have been given the great privilege to lead the work in two different council circuits this spring, both the TTE and the COMPET, with the overall aim to both contribute to a safer, greener and freer European Union. This place, where I'm standing and where you are sitting, is at the very forefront of the green transition in Europe. I, I don't know what comes to mind when, when you think of Sweden um, or when you, when you hear of Sweden. Some of you might think of the Swedish musical miracle like ABBA, Roxette or Swedish House Mafia. Maybe you're thinking of Astrid Lindgren or those uh, red painted wooden houses. Untamed wilderness as we saw in the, in the short film clip here, vast archipelagos and moose and reindeer, but I'd like to add another entry to that list, LKAB, the Swedish mines. Because this is the site of the most modern underground iron ore mine in the world. LKAB has taken the lead in a global transformation of the iron and steel industry by setting a new world standard for mining producing carbon-free sponge iron and extracting critical raw material. The Swedish presidency begins at a time char characterized by deep uncertainty. Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine and the Ukrainian people has plunged the continent into an energy crisis which has led to inflation and sending electricity bills to record highs for both households and companies. But it has also highlighted the need to speed up Euro the European Union's transition from fossil energy and from Russian gas in particular. Technical progress and investment in fossil-free energy are crucial for industries, transport, jobs and welfare in the EU. Abandoning fossil fuels is also a way to strangle Putin's economic ability to wage war. The consequences of the war also clearly show that the EU must invest in long-term competitiveness. Today, significantly less is invested in research and development in, within the European Union compared to the US and China. It is not in Europe that new large companies are founded, sadly. And the lack of innovation has made many countries in Europe extra vulnerable to Putin's hybrid war and especially to his cynical energy war. The presidency will raise competitiveness and a competitive EU to the highest political level this coming spring. The EU's response to the US subsidies to green technology must aim to both avoid trade war, but also a competition on who can provide the most state aid, both within the European Union and vis-a-vis -vis the US. Therefore, a coordinated response within the European, on a European level is therefore preferable compared to then obviously individual member states uh, stepping in with national support. I think at a very special, special timing when we are celebrating 30 years of uh, um, the internal and, and single market, we would have a situation where we would distort competition in the internal market and particularly disadvantage the smaller states within the union. Common measures taken must have long-term competitiveness as a main goal and be accompanied, I think, with a better regulation agenda. 
The crises facing the Union are very much intertwined. Ultimately, it is competitive companies and fossil free energy and electricity that creates sustainable growth, increases the EU's common resilience, strengthens the Union's geopolitical importance and influence in an increasingly polarized world. The climate change will not be resolved unless the EU countries lead the way. The European Union is well on its way on getting the Fit for 55 package in place, which will reduce emissions by 55% by 2030 and towards a net emission, as net zero emissions by 2050. And it is by showing that emission reductions can be combined with economic growth that the Union should lead the global climate work. An absolutely basic prerequisite for the European green transition is raw materials. Basically, it's this. What I'm holding in my hand is a piece of, um, of iron ore uh, and everything that comes with it, because it's not only the primary source, it's also the wonderful secondary sources that we need to look out for, but they are dependent on each other and they are central components in every green technology that we possibly could think of moving forward. I'm therefore grateful for the opportunity to, in this beautiful mine, elaborate on uh, the importance of uh, raw materials for the European Union and why we are at such an important crossroad as a union. The EU aims to take a lead in this industrial transformation. In the regions of Norrbotten and Vesterbotten, where we are now, several major business establishments and business expansions that play an important role in the tr transition are ongoing. The hybrid project, for example, that you will hear more about in just a few minutes, is a prime example since it aims to replace coking coal traditionally needed for ore-based steel making, with hydrogen. And the result will be the world's first fossil-free steel making technology with virtually no carbon footprint. If completed, the project alone will reduce Sweden's emissions, total emissions, by 10%. One-tenth will be evaporated. Minerals and metals are essential to the functioning and integrity of a wide range of industrial ecosystems. Today, we acknowledge that many so-called critical minerals have shown to be irreplaceable components to numerous green and emerging technologies. They are essential in industry developments, especially renewable energy systems, electric vehicles, and rechargeable batteries. However, the EU is dependent on imports of materials required to enable the green transition. So while we consume about 20% of the global world production of metals, we only account for 30% of production. We want to change that. And the demand of critical raw materials is only expected to rise in the coming years. According to the Commission, demand will increase by 500% by 2030. However, China, accounts for approximately 70% of the world's production of metals needed to facilitate the green transition. Take, for example, lithium. As you all know, a key component in batteries where the EU is a 100% import reliant. While only around 9% of the world's lithium is mined in China, approximately 60% is refined there. It is therefore increasingly important to ensure a sustainable domestic supply of raw materials in order to achieve EU's high climate ambition. But also to ensure self-sufficiency in order to move away from today's dependency on only a few countries. So, I don't think I've ever looked this much forward <laughs> to an act, an up upcoming act from the Commission ever before. Uh, but we're very much looking forward to the upcoming Raw Materials Act uh, from the Commission. The act will be presented in uh, the end of March and will be given high priority during our presidency. Given the huge demand 
geopolitical situation and the access to raw materials within the EU and the value chains needed to facilitate the green transition, the anticipated act needs to enable supply of sustainable raw materials from both primary and secondary sources. This includes actions focusing on increased EU production, but also on research efficiency, circularity, and diversified global trade. We need it all, and we need it now. So, just to summarize this part, the European Union has invested heavily in the green transition, as you all know, but are dependent on the key ingredient. And if I can just give you a very, very simple parable, you can't make a cinnamon bun uh, if you don't have your own production. And suddenly, a virus puts an end to all trade of a cinnamon. We have seen what happened when we were too dependent on Russian gas, and that can't happen again. I'd like to just finish one minute um, by shortly describing the Swedish mining industry, because Sweden has a long, long history of mining and metal refining, stretching back actually to more than a thousand years. The mining industry remains a key industry, and we are today one of the EU's leading ore and metal producing countries. We are well endowed with minerals containing base metals, and I think that um, it's probably s hard to see in the back, but this is obviously a map of Sweden, uh, and uh, um, uh, the, the, the resources that we have under underground, and I'd like you to have a look at this map um, maybe later on, but here we have such things as copper, zinc, and lead, also precious metals as uh, gold and silver, but we we have also a strong exploration potential of innovation critical m minerals and, uh, and metals, such as previously mentioned graphite, but also rare uh, elements like lithium, cobalt, vanadium, tungsten, and tellurium. We are at the forefront of innovation driven extractive industry but also on related technology and equipment production, highly instrumented and automated operations. Operations which have made Sweden one of the most sustainable mining nations in the world. And the goal for the Swedish mining industry and operations is to be fossil free by 2035. Today, our focus is on the new challenges we have ahead of us. The mining industry is on a transformational path more than ever sustainable and sustainability needs to be a key driver for the industry. And once again, thank you so much for listening and my very most warm welcome to this cold but wonderful part of Sweden. Thank you. <laughs>